past two years, I've been involved in the area of finance and investment, and I have been so impressed by the people that I met there. Smart, well-educated, sometimes super nice people. And to me, it's been such a contradiction, because when you look at the way investments are done in the world, they are done completely disregarding the effects on the common world when you make the decision to invest or not. I mean, there are so many millions of dollars that go, for example, into fossil fuel. And the decision to go into fossil fuel is made without considering what happens to the world with climate change. So I was really triggered. I started thinking, and uh, of course, it's about money, short-term wealth. And of course, the people working in investments, they are part of the market that we are all part of. But uh, even Adam Smith, you remember him, the economist with the invisible hand that will just solve any problems in society with supply and demand. Even Adam Smith said that he cannot solve, or the market cannot solve externalities, good or bad. That's why we have politicians. So yes, investments are made in the world of the market. But still, what, in what worldview does it make it a rational decision to completely disregard that we are firing up the world? And it got me thinking, perhaps we could uh, find an alternative worldview where when we fund and place money, it can produce not only wealth, but maybe also value to us. So today I will try to uh, compare the world of finance with the world of the nature and look at the worldviews that guides uh, uh, money making and ecosystems. So how do we actually make money? Well, uh, we farm money in money farms. Sometimes we call them funds. Uh, there's the money farmer. Uh, sometimes we call him the fund manager. Uh, that's the guy you'll find in your bank or in your insurance company. Uh, he will manage a fund. And what is a fund? Well, a fund is a group of companies that interact uh, together with each other to generate wealth. But they also interact and influence the outside world, companies outside the fund and society at large. So this guy, the, the fund manager or the money farmer, he will grow his crops, money, to get yield, more money. And for this, he will get paid in money. And so we have a clue here as to why he doesn't take the fate of the world into accountability when he decides what, what investments to make. And that is, he doesn't get paid to do so. It doesn't, doesn't matter if he creates value or if he creates far, harm, he will still be get paid. That's perhaps not so surprising, but what is more surprising is that sometimes he gets paid regardless of whether he actually generates wealth or not. We pay him just to keep our money in his farm. He gets a percentage of all the money that is lounging around in the farm. Okay, so um, what kind of world does this money farmer live in? The world that the money farmer inhabits, and maybe all of us, is very logical. It's, uh, you can use control to, to see what happens. For example, if you put an input at the top of this system, it's a system of cogs or wheels with teeth, you know what will come out, preferably money or wealth. Uh, you can start and you can stop and basically uh, be in charge of this process. Uh, there are some principles that guides this guy, the money farmer, when he wants to grow money in, in this world. And I'm going to go through two of them. The first one is growth. Growth is really good. Going up is great. Going down is very bad. There is no value in going down. When you go down, you sell. Everybody does. That's the market. Um, and efficiencies, that's something like the money farmer likes. Creating efficiencies and specializations among the companies in your fund, that's a good way to create growth, and when you get growth, you get wealth. Um, so this is the world of the, uh, the, money mark, uh, the, um, the money farmer. If we look at the next principle, it's about external effects, that's what I mentioned before, bad effects on the world. The money farmer sees any external effect from the company often as negative, as bad. It should be kept out of the business as much as you can. The money farmer will do so fighting with nails and claws to keep the externalities out, but sometimes they are forced to deal with e negative externalities. That could be politicians giving a company a fine for environmental pollution, for example. Or it could be an NGO or media writing about bad working conditions somewhere in the world. And you know what? 
I think it's such a pity that the money farmer is so uh, negative, has such a negative attitude to externalities, because most externalities, or at least many externalities, are positive. That's what I call value. The effect on, on societies and the world we are from companies can be very good. They can contribute to integration, to infrastructure, to better environment, for example. I'm supporting a bank now that has a special package of goods and services for uh, newly arrived migrants to Sweden. And their package is helping these migrants in the, on the road to integration. That's a great societal effect from this bank. But the money farmer doesn't like externalities, so they are mostly kept out. Okay, so this is one worldview. We will now go to the other worldview, to the other side, nature, ecosystem. What is actually an ecosystem? It can be my body, it can be uh, the world, it can be a coral reef, for example. Uh, the definition is an ecosystem is a group of species of animals and plants that interact and influence each other in a dynamic way and also interact and influence other species and ecosystems outside its own. Uh, and when they do so, they, it creates value. This ecosystem, it doesn't actually work like the system of wheels that we saw earlier. It works more like a society of ants. In the previous picture, cause, fo on cause follows effect. It's possible to control. This system is very hard to control. It's even very difficult to predict. Um, let's say, for example, changes are happening in quick, sudden, catastrophic events. Let's say, for example, that you have a lake. Uh, the lake suffers additions of acid water during many, many years. And uh, nothing happens in the lake because the ecosystem, the species and the animals, they will absorb this outside influence to try to maintain the state that it's in. One day it will reach a threshold and the lake will die very quickly. That's what's called a threshold effect. So if you made a risk assessment or a risk analysis on this lake based on the a picture of the world that the money farmer has that on cause a little acid water follows effect a little sicker late lake you might have thought that there wasn't a problem in the lake during all of these years and then all of a sudden it just dies so control is a really bad tool if you want to manage an ecosystem much better are trial error and most importantly feedback to understand what state the system is like so we will look at the principles that I went through earlier. Growth, for example. We have growth in ecosystems. Or shall I say, actually, development. Because an ecosystem doesn't grow like this. It grows more in eternal eights. You have a period of growth, and then you have a period of degrowth. And you have a period of growth. And in the period of degrowth, something really important happens because this is when the ecosystem readjusts. It takes into account external effects. It takes into account new species. It finds new ways to generate value. So this is actually the secret to a continuing, long-lasting, long-term value generation. I talked about efficiencies earlier, and in fact, efficiencies in the terms of ecosystems, they're not so hot. Uh, efficiencies can actually create risk to the ecosystem. Uh, let's say that you have a forest, you want to increase the output of wood, so you plant many pine trees very near to each other and they start to grow. You will increase the output of wood, but at the same time you will inc uh, accumulate risk because the, wood that is the, the forest that is very specialized will also be more uh, vulnerable to uh, pests, to storm, to fire. So you will increase risk in your own ecosystem. And if you're really unlucky, y the, the risk that you created will spread to the forests around your own forest. So you might actually cr push the risk that you created into a system level, trying to create efficiencies in your ecosystem. Okay, let's look at external effects. Uh, external effects are uh, not excluded in the ecosystem. They are actually a precondition for growth. As I said, they are taking into account to create value inside the ecosystem, so it doesn't exist alone. So there we are, two very different views of the world. In one, control is good, efficiencies create growth, Ex externalities are bad, and you create wealth. And the other, um, Growth happens in eternal aids. Externalities are necessary to create value, and efficiency is a risk. 
Still, there are some real similarities here between the fund and the ecosystem. They are both a group of organisms and organizations that interact and influence each other and that interact and influence society at large. So I thought we'd make a little bit of an experiment here. What if the fund actually works like an ecosystem? What would it mean to the fund? What would what, what we think is a risk, for example? Well, my first reaction when I, when I did this myself is that Okay, so uh, extreme efficiencies and fast growing and never readjusting to the environment. Remember the forest? That's mainstream business model. That's what we do when you manage a fund. So would it mean that the mainstream business model is actually a risk to the fund itself, not to mention the rest of us? Still, I wanted to think, okay, let's say you are a money farmer and you want to have a resilient money fund. What would you do? Uh, well, the first thing you would have to do is to try to mimic the degrowth cycle. You want to create a situation when the companies in your portfolio reconnects to the outside world, freeing up capital to do so, in order to reduce risk and harness business opportunities. It's not that you can't grow, it's that you will grow li like this. Harnessing the degrowth and readjustment of an ecosystem. This idea of reconnection is not uh, new, and in fact, it doesn't even come from resilience research. It's a, a, an, uh, an idea that came from a macroeconomist called Schumpeter, and it's called creative destruction. It actually exists already today in business. For example, in Google, Google allows their em employees to spend a day a week doing whatever their heart desires. It doesn't seem so very lean to do so or not so very efficient. But the purpose of this activity is to avoid the risk of sudden catastrophic surprises and to get a continuous flow of new business opportunities. Okay, the resilient money farmer, what else could he do? Well, in my mind, he should strive not only to create wealth, but also to create value. Why? I mean, of course, it's good for all of us, and the money farmer is also all of us when he goes home from work. But it's good for all of us to uh, have sus uh, companies create value. But it could actually be good for the company itself. From value creation, you get wealth creation. Basically, it can be good for business. Remember the bank that uh, contributed to integration? To uh, the, its customers, the newly arrived migrants, it's a very good thing. But to the bank itself, it's also a very good thing because they get access to a new customer segment. Uh, negative externalities, I mentioned them in passing, but of course they're also very important to a resilient money farmer. A resilient money farmer should, for example, keep track on carbon, the carbon footprint of the fund, for many different reasons. Okay, so this was a dream. Uh, could it ever come true? Um, I think that for this to become a reality, if we disregard the system aspect that I mentioned in the beginning, that the market was never intended to deal with externalities, there are still two issues that actually um, that revolves the money farmer. The one is the rewards. We have to stop pay the money, paying the money farmer just for har having our money like cows in a field. We have to start paying him for generating wealth and value. And the second is that the money farmer has to believe in the worldview that is a little bit more like the ecosystem. Efficiencies aren't only good. Specialization and external effects, er, external effects aren't only bad. And this is actually the reason why I wanted to share this idea with all of you today and me. Because guess who has all of this money in the money farmer's farm? Me, I have it, and I bet you that every one of you also has a crown or two in the bank. So that means that we could help the money farmer to understand the connection between wealth and value. Uh, so I would like to finalize this by recommending that when this day is over, you call up your money farmer and you ask two things. And the first th thing it would be, for what do I pay you? Basically, do I pay you to generate wealth or maybe even value? Or do I pay you to just keep my money in the fund? And the second question you should ask is, what is success to you? 
What is a successful company? Do you measure that only in wealth generation? Or do you have any idea or control over what wealth or what value that the companies in your uh, fund generates? For example, does the funny farmer know what kind of carbon footprint that the fund has? Because to paraphrase Hermann Hesse, whatever good fortune that we might have, it doesn't get meaning until we transform it into something of value. Thank you.